we can. Yes, we can. Okay, so um, originally last week, Jeremy asked me to give um, an overview about the NOAA Climate Program Office um, Arctic Research Program atmospheric measurements, and um, I felt like it was very hard to stay within the boundaries of just what's been happening with the Arctic Research Program because what we've been doing has been such a coordinating and integration um, effort both across um, the agency and between the agencies and internationally. So I'm going to say that what this presentation is going to be about is going to be Pan-Arctic Atmospheric Measurements, and there will just be a little bit of a NOAA flavor to this. So <clears throat> I've had this vision for a long time that I would be able to eventually be doing presentations completely using our website, and I wouldn't have to put PowerPoint presentations um, together anymore. Sandy told me that some of the people on this call would be actually looking at a PowerPoint presentation because they wouldn't be logged in through WebEx. And so what I did is I kind of have partially to my dream where I'm going to be giving a, um, every PowerPoint slide will actually be a screenshot from the ISOA um, website. And you can see the address up there. And each of these slides should have a link that's a um, linked address. So you can actually go there. And I'm going to encourage everybody to spend some time, if it's of interest to them, to look around this site because we have been doing quite a lot with it. Um, I think it's getting to be very functional in terms of integrating these um, surface measurements around the Arctic, and also hopefully other people will be able to run presentations themselves. So this PowerPoint presentation can, to a certain degree, be considered to be sort of an operating manual for the website. Next slide. So if you go onto the website, and I don't know, can people see my cursor? I, I usually use the can, yes. Yeah. Okay, so if you go up to observatories, and there'll be a pull-down menu, and you'll see a bunch of the observatories, and at the bottom there'll be something that'll take you to this link, which is the ISOA um, observatories tour page. And you'll notice that there's some different lists. One is showing these different kinds of um, global observing networks. One is showing different institutions, and the next is these actually will change the background in the center here to different kinds of gridded data data sets. Next slide. So if you were to click on the NOAA link here, what it would happen on the observatories page is you would see the NOAA logo would come up for all the observatories in the network that NOAA kind of has their finger on the pulse of what's going on or is making contributions. And from the Arctic Research Program, that includes, in particular, Eureka, Alert, and TIXI. And from the Global Monitoring Division, um, which is one of NOAA's um, laboratories, that would be Barrow, Alaska, Chertsky, and Summit Greenland. Next slide. Um, if you click on NSF, um, NSF's primary um, investments that they have right now in this Pan-Arctic Observing Network is in Summit Greenland, and then when we were setting up the TIXI Observatory, they were a major partner and had a considerable contribution in the, um, in the um, infrastructure development. And I will make note of the fact that I think that NSF grantees probably, if you were to do an inventory, have got activities at many of these other observatories, and I didn't do any kind of a um, um, survey of that, so this is just showing where um, NSF currently has major infrastructure investment. Next slide. The next slide um, is showing um, where Department of Energy has investments, and theirs, of course, is primarily Barrow, and secondly, they have a site now at Alooktuk Point, Alaska. And the reason I have them here for Eureka Canada and Summit Greenland is that they, through our data portal, or actually they have a value-added products, and so they are hosting some of the complex radar data that's collected at these two sites because they're well-equipped to do that from a data management standpoint, um, even if they don't, um, um, you know, have other investments there, they're doing data support. Next slide, please. NASA shows up at a lot of sites 
and to my knowledge that is because of their AeroNet program and they are measuring aerosol optical depth not only at these five um, um, ISO sites, but also they have actually probably about another five sites scattered around this ring that are not part of the ISO consortium but are part of the AeroNet consortium. Next slide. So if you were to go over to here now into observatory info, like this is the coolest one which I can't click on, but if you clicked on temperature, you could see right now what the temperature was at each one of the observatories, which is always kind of fun. And these other um, sites are showing you some of the global networks that are supported at which of the sites. I'm going to call out on a couple of these because I said this presentation is going to have a NOAA flavor. And I would like to note like the baseline surface radiation network program which we have right now at six of the sites, and next slide, the Global Atmosphere Watch Station, which is being supported almost throughout the complete network. Um, I would hazard to say that if it hadn't been for the efforts of the NOAA Global Monitoring Division that these, um, that these two programs may never have gotten as far as they have gotten, and so that has been a significant NOAA contribution. Next slide. If you go up again to this observatories tab and click on it, there'll be a pull down and it will show you each one of the observatories. And I'm showing you an example here of what kind of information you get on the different observatories, including like Barrow is an interesting one because here this tab is showing you the NOAA GMD baseline observatory, but because Barrow has so much um, contributions from Department of Energy, this is where you would get the DOE sites if you clicked on these. And I would really encourage anybody from the other agencies to look at these carefully to see if that we have the information there that you want to have there. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, second station that um, NOAA has a fairly um, significant contributions at is at Summit Greenland. That is mostly through the Global Monitoring Division. The infrastructure there is primarily supported and most of the Projects are supported through grants from the National Science Foundation, but GMD from NOAA has um, established some long-term monitoring programs, and ISO has been sort of had our, our finger has touched upon this site because um, we helped install some radiation equipment there to do some long um, um, calibrations of some historical um, data sets that were there. Next slide. And then, of course, my favorite, as you all know, is Tixie Russia, where I have spent the much, most time. And NOAA has partnered with uh, Russ Hydromet from the Russian Federation and the Finnish Meteorological Institute um, to um, put together a fairly well-equipped laboratory now that has got quite a bit of observing capacity, though also a lot of space for additional observing capacity to be added. Next slide. From here on out in the presentation, I'm going to say basically I'm going to just touch at a couple things and I'm going to really not go into them very much. Um, Sandy Starkweather, who is the ISO implementation scientist when she's not being the IARPIC implementation scientist, is going to be giving a plenary speech at the, um, I don't know, are we calling it a USM? the Arctic Open Science um, Meeting, Ar Arctic Observing Open Science Meeting that's going to be in Seattle next month. And so she's going to be talking much more about these things about how our data portals work and then how our science groups work. So suffice it to say that in terms of using this presentation as a manual, as a guide to navigate around our site, if you were to click on this link, then you would actually go to the site and you can play around with it and see how we have um, um, ingested from a number of archives, NOAA and otherwise, I think, is it Sandy, about a thousand data sets now? And that is a work in progress, but probably one of the most important things in terms of being able to inventory and access all the data so that we can take a panarctic science approach. <clears throat> um, and if you were to click on the science page here, the science link, you'll see a pull down. And the main page will talk to you about this science overview. And it will describe to you the fact that we have developed six separate working groups that have presentations from, or that have um, participants 
from um, other agencies. It has participants from academia, and it has participants from um, people who work at all the other um, observatories in the other countries. Next slide. And I'll go through this fairly quickly. Again, if you go to the science slide and if you were to select the aerosols tab, you would see that there would be some little, there would be information about what the ISO aerosols working group is doing, and there would be a series of articles here describing some of their latest work, some of their science concerns, contacts about some of the latest information about the issue of aerosols um, in the Arctic. Next slide. Same thing, come to the, or to the science, click down on the net radiation, and you would see a number of issues that the, um, that the ISOA radiation group is working with. Likewise, for the atmosphere surface exchanges group, one thing that is really cool about the ISO observatories is almost everybody has put in a tower, and they range from two meters, I think is the shortest one in Alert Canada, and the tallest one is that astonishingly high 50-meter tower in Summit Greenland that I can't even imagine how they keep that thing standing straight up on top of the Arctic ice sheet. And then we have a methane, ozone, and trace gases group. Um, here again, you can see there will be sort of these science highlights about the latest things that these groups are looking at. In this case, we're looking at ozone depletion events um, at Arrow, Alert, Tixie, and Summit. And then we have a clouds working group. And the clouds working group is the one that is probably the one that is the most uh, gleam in our eye and is less developed, but some of the other ones have been meeting now um, about every six weeks with a teleconference that ISOA sets up between um, the members of the, um, each group, usually with participants from all of the eight Arctic countries and um, a large number of the 10 observatories to um, contribute um, towards that. Next slide. And finally, we have this regional processes group, which is a very interesting one, and I'll have a couple more slides about this, because now the question is, is how do we use this entire network? How can we design experiments? How can we organize the data to do more than, um, and really address these large-scale problems um, as will be posed, as you'll see, by things by the year of polar prediction. In the end, I think the concept is, is even though we have these topical, thematic, separate working groups, the idea is, is that the whole Arctic atmosphere is a system, and we'll be hoping that we will be sort of cross-fertilizing between the groups, and they'll start putting together a holistic picture of the, how the entire Arctic atmosphere operates as an entity. And once we have that piece put together, then we will be able to start um, coordinating more effectively with our terrestrial colleagues that are looking at things that's what's going on, for instance, groups like the Global Cryosphere Watch, and also all the oceanographic groups. Because certainly, um, you know, there is a concept of the Arctic being a system but it's still very difficult for the different disciplines to work together. But, but the goal here is that we can be the go-to place for the whole Arctic system. Next slide. Um, even though there is a lot of research being facilitated by and a lot of reports and a lot of data products and a lot of operation procedures being uh, facilitated by the ISO working groups, and again, that will be something that Andy will talk about next month, there is other research that we don't really particularly facilitate in general, and they take this Antarctic approach. You have the slides. I'm all set. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Is there a question? But anyways, um, this Pan-Arctic approach seems to be getting quite popular, and the Pan-Arctic approach to me is figuring out what you can about the Arctic system, Arctic atmosphere, that you really can't get a good handle on by looking at a single site by itself. That the idea is that there's regional distributions and differences that need to be considered. Here is an example of three papers that all came out in 2015 that used a pan-Arctic approach. I didn't make a tally of how many um, different 
observatories were involved, but I will tell you this um, this um, paper that was looking at this whole issue about whether methane is going to be coming pouring out of the Arctic because of a melting permafrost and is the East Siberian Shelf a particular source. Um, this particular paper had um, four ISO observatories involved with it. Um, this particular paper which talked about how Arctic clouds are affecting the warming Arctic and we all know that people always come back with the models saying that they don't have the clouds well enough modeled or developed to understand what's going on. This utilized um, data from three of the um, observatories and this paper which was looking at uh, um, simulations of black carbon and sulfur concentrations but constraining them using here the comprehensive measurement data set and I think this used something like six or seven Arctic um, aircraft campaigns and then data from something like six or seven of the ISO observatories from the surface stuff. So again, the Pan-Arctic approach is, makes a lot of sense. It is being implemented not just within the ISO, but also across um, the research community. And I like to think that the data portal that we're providing is facilitating a lot of science, even though it goes outside of our working groups, which is just great. Um, here's an advertisement for the AUSM meeting that Sandy will be presenting at front and center, and she will be talking about this. So you'll you'll probably see a lot of slides from the um, ISOA um, webpage, but doing a completely different kind of presentation. Next slide, and. <clears throat> In terms of, again, trying to put this whole system, this whole network of Pan-Arctic measurements to work now, um, trying to figure out how we can do that, I think that the one big thing that we have our eye on now is going to be the year of polar prediction. And we just submitted a paper calling application of ISO circumpolar observations and studies of atmospheric transports into the Arctic for the year of polar prediction. And um, that will be a white paper that will get reviewed, I understand, and then that will get posted as part of Arctic Science Summit Week um, in the Arctic Observing System component. Um, I'd like to mention that in the AOS 2016, they had five category areas, and the first one was basically Jeremy is going to be the chair of, and that was talking about methods and programs for sustained observations which seems like it would have been the right place to put an uh, ISOA-related um, um, presentation, but Sandy did a white paper on ISOA, I think for the 2013 Arctic Observing Summit, and that was the one where I feel like it talked about this as a mechanism for sustaining observations. And now in 2016, three years later, we've kind of made this leap forward to how we can be supporting global initiatives. Next slide. And I talked to Jeff Key. I'm kind of pulling out of the surface now. I do want to make note of the fact that um, NOAA has uh, developed quite a bit of capacity with some specific satellite um, products here. Um, I didn't have time to show you, but there are places on the web where we're putting together tools where we can start merging surface and satellite data. and these particular products that are specific to the polar regions are very useful. And I think as NOAA is developing its um, complete obser Arctic observing program, that these will be blended together with what we're doing at the surface for the atmosphere. Next slide. Um, if people want more um, information, we just led, uh, we just put together two articles. One is got 53 co-authors, and I think I might have actually forgotten to put the title of the paper. Is it in, oh, there it is, there it is down at the bottom. I can't find it in the sea of co-authors. But this is International Arctic Systems Observing in the Atmosphere and the International Polar Year Legacy Consortium. And much of the material where I described you here is covered in that paper. 
in the same article of the bulletin, there will be an inbox article um, called Cyber Infrastructure and Collaboratory Support for the Integration of Arctic Atmospheric Research. And that kind of goes into the nuts and bolts about how we have developed this innovative um, data portal that updates itself and works on harvesting metadata files out of other archives all over the place and um, creates like this virtual archive that is a treasure trove of atmospheric data in the Arctic. And it also talks about this collaboratory support which has allowed this um, consortium to move forward scientifically. And I would like to note that there were 53 co-authors. There were, because, you know, and the, this is because I'm speaking to you IARPIC people, there were four different groups, distinct groups in NOAA that were co-authors and had presentations or had contributions to this paper. And as we pulled in our, um, our um, academic colleagues there, this paper also acknowledges 10 NSF grants and four DOE grants. So I feel like that this has really been a successful interagency activity, even though it's sort of originating out of Jeremy's program there at CPO. And I think that's my last slide. All right, thanks, Tennille, for that uh, great overview. Does anybody have any questions for Tennille? All right, well, as she said, uh, a lot more of this will be presented uh, at the Open Observing meeting in Seattle next month, so uh, we can follow up then. All right, if we move on, do we have uh, uh, Lillian on the phone? I don't see Lil on the list of participants. Lil, are you calling in? Sandy, did you hear back from Lil? I did hear back from Lil, and she it did sound like she was going to call in. Um, so if she's not taking herself off mute, um, I think there were there are other people uh, on the call who were at the workshop and who could maybe uh, say some words about it. Sure, we'll open it up to anybody that uh, that was there and can give an update. Um, hi, this is Robin Bronin from the Alaska Institute for Justice, and um, I was one of about 20 participants at the workshop in Seattle, which was all about, um, as you know, community-based observing, and it was a great workshop. Um, there were representatives from um, I can't remember all of the different government agencies, indigenous participants. Um, and then NGOs like myself that have received um, government grant awards to do community-based observing. And so we really focused on trying to, um, I would say, standardize the terminology of what is community-based observing, because depending on whether or not you're from a government agency, an NGO, or um, an indigenous participant, that, uh, that terminology means something different to you. And so um, we focused the first day on trying to develop a common language to talk about community-based observing, and then on the second day, um, trying to figure out how to move the initiative forward in um, ongoing projects. Great, thank you very much. Does anybody have anything else to add to that? So yeah, this is, go ahead. No, that's okay, go ahead. Yes, uh, this is uh, Matthew Druckenmiller. Um, I'll, I'll point out that I, I was at the workshop as well. And um, on the second day, we, we broke up into groups to uh, do different types of writing and the group that I was involved in uh, worked on a, a white paper for submission to the Arctic Observing Summit which will be submitted later this week as we had a, an extension that it is making the case for um, using community-based monitoring as, as, as a 
a reason to, or a, a further justification for greater connections between SEON and the uh, Global Earth Observation System of Systems, GEOS, uh, noting that GEOS and GEO are, are now um, entering its, its second decade of implementation with um, a greater focus on users. And so in this uh, white paper, we're, we're making the case that community-based monitoring in the Arctic could provide a template for GEO to employ in other GEO regions. All right, thank you, Matthew. Anyone else? This is uh, Moses Chiripano uh, with the Alaska Native Travel Health Consortium. I uh, unfortunately wasn't able to attend the Seattle uh, workshop, but was aware of it. And one of the tools I would like to be able to bring to the table and introduce you folks uh, is to the uh, ANTHC's Local Environmental Observer Network, or LEO Network, um, which is comprised of about uh, over 350 members, uh, tribal community members in their, uh, within the state of Alaska who uh, collect anecdotal information throughout the state of Alaska and, posts it, and is posted on our leonetwork.org website, uh, which is in the process of launching the, the, the app's uh, viewers available and then there's uh, eventually going to be a LEO observer. Once you become a LEO, you'd be able to post your observation as opposed to as opposed to going onto the internet and uh, uploading your data. Great. Thanks, Thank you Moses. very much. Yeah, actually, I just was pulling up um, Mike Brubaker's profile on the um, uh, ARPIC collaboration site, Mike has um, has had the opportunity to share a little bit about the NEO LEO network and it, it would be great to have an opportunity to get some updates on um, what you've been doing more recently. Certainly. Um, right now we still haven't fully launched the LEO network app uh, itself. It's still a sort of big work in progress. We're still figuring out how to, there's an uh, excuse me, iPhone version of it available. Uh, through uh, iTunes, uh, the, the Adobe, uh, excuse me, um, uh, let's see here, the Samsung or the, uh, uh, the other phone is eventually going to be ready here pretty soon. We do have coming up here as uh, one of the work, uh, presentation workshop here up in Alaska and Fred is the Alaska, uh, Alaska Travel Conference on Alaska Travel Conference on Environmental Management next week. Um, where uh, LEO, as well as a, a variety of other programs here at ANTHC at the Center for Climate and Health will be presenting, along with other folks throughout the state of Alaska and other organizations. Well, as for LEO, um, we're still using some of the old method for folks to be able to post observations via uh, SurveyMonkey from our, uh, our currently running site, which uh, Mike has it right there underneath his name. Um, or to see ES climate, you can click to take a look at that. Uh, but the new version is going to be a much more robust, robust uh, tool for communities, uh, members with, uh, or anybody that wants to be, become a LEO to be able to post an observation much easier and faster. But you don't need, necessarily need to be at the desk. It's just an app and it's ready to go. It's viewable at the LEO network.org website. Any questions? Well, thanks, Moses. That's uh, it's valuable um, valuable information. While while we're on the point of the uh, AOS, um, I'd be curious if there's anybody else. So this through this forum, we had uh, presented sort of this Arctic Executive Steering Committee framework for uh, white papers on community based. Observing, and Matt indicated that um, the workshop had resulted in some contributions. Were there any other contributions um, that came in? We don't need to know specifics. I'm, I'm just curious if there was some um, uh, other other people who submitted uh, to that session. Um, this is Robin again from um, Alaska. Yes, I did. Great, thanks, Robin. And hi, Robin. Hopefully, I'll see you there. I'm sure we'll see you there. 
Yeah, awesome. Okay, Sandy, anything else on that do we need to cover? No, thanks. Thanks to everyone who spoke up. That was valuable. All right, so we can move on. We have Craig Lee on the phone. Craig, are you there? Uh, yes, I'm here. All right, Craig, so Craig's going to give us – I'm sorry. So, Craig, do you want to show your slides or do you want me to show them? If you could show them, that would be great, please. Okay, sure will. All right. Craig, you give us an update on the uh, Arctic Observing Open Science meeting that we've been hearing about. Go ahead, Craig, whenever you're ready. Yeah, let me get the slides up. Yep. So I can start while the slides are coming up. Uh, so we have the three co-chairs for the Open Science meeting on the phone here, Matt Shoup, Kathy Wilson, and I. So we've been, uh, we've been sharing the load of putting this together along with a, a very good organizing committee. And it's been pushing this forward. Um, as you can see, the, the, the open science meeting is, is something that we, we really haven't done since 2009, which is the, the last large opportunity to kind of look at the, the scope of science results coming out of Arctic Observing. And that meeting was primarily focused on the NSF portion of the Arctic Observing Network, the program as it stood at that time. The idea here was to focus more broadly on all Arctic observing networks and to really create a, a forum where we could talk about the scientific achievements that have stemmed from, from these observing activities. So we've had a lot of meetings over the intervening time. They've talked about collaboration, coordination, planning, um, lots of important things for getting the network up and running. But there, there was this field there was a need to hold a, a science-focused meeting where people could really, really review what's been done, kind of assess the set and, and talk about where we might go next, build new collaborations, and identify new directions. So Seattle at the Hyatt at Olive 8, 17 through 19 November 2015. So that's coming right up. If we go to the next slide, please. So the objectives, the, the top objective is, is the primary one, really to present and discuss findings and advances resulting from the network, from the set of our observations. And again, very broad net, not just the NSF AOM, but, but Arctic Observing CAST more broadly. Um, Matt and Kathy, please feel free to chime in, too, if I'm misspeaking or we, we want to add anything else. Um, we also want to review the technological achievements, operational achievements of the network, so what, what has happened, what's in place, what new technologies are there, what developments have occurred. Uh, this would be an opportunity to, to look at the fit of the scientific findings and, and the achievements operationally and technologically to so what have been viewed as both the, uh, the basic research and the, the operational and mission-driven objectives for the network. So how, how well are we doing relative to, to where we, we thought we needed to be? Right, how well are the current activities and findings suiting the, uh, fitting, fitting the objectives that were, were laid out some time ago in a number of documents, including the uh, the various search documents defining the science and implementation plans for the network. And then the other piece was to actually try, try to put better definition on the, the Interagency Arctic Observing Network, what we're calling the IAON. Um, there, there's a bit of an identity crisis about what exactly this, this is and what its mission is. Um, there's some confusion, and it would be nice to actually start to, to define that even more explicit about what we're expecting there. Uh, next slide, please. So we posed a few background questions. These are on the, on the website, um, really to try to get attendees to, to think about these things. You, you can see these. I'm not going to read through them, but they essentially question the things that, that, that we've just, just talked about. Um, the, there will be room for lots of discussion. Over the course of the uh, over the course of the meeting, and the hope is that we can start to make some progress on, on answering these questions. Next slide, please. So the meeting is really structured in, in three parts. Um, you heard Tanil talk about Sandy's presentation on the atmosphere. There'll be a number of plenary talks. You can see them listed there. Um, the plenary talks were designed to cover various various regimes or sectors of 
of research. And the instruction to the plenary speakers is to, to provide a, a broad overview of science achievements in these areas. So, so not just to stand up and talk about one person's particular achievements or, or their particular interests, but to try to paint a, a much broader picture of what that community has been able to accomplish over the years. Uh, Craig, could I, uh, this is Kathy, could I add one other thing there to the kind of the instruction to the speakers? Go for it. I, I was just going to say, sorry about the rain in the background. Um, that we were we were also asking the speakers to uh, think about how um, uh, networks of one kind or another, where, whether they were networks of monitoring um, equipment or networks of people, um, enabled the scientific achievements that they they were going to be talking about. So that there was uh, there's a real focus in the plenary session and in the meeting as a whole on the concept of, of um, networks of people and networks of instruments to Im improve scientific understanding. No, thanks, Kat. That, that's an excellent point, right? The part of this is what do we get from having a network that we don't get from just having individual activity in the Arctic? What advances is that enabled? So after that will be a, an agency panel. OSTP, various federal agencies. Um, I should point out that NSF is the primary sponsor for the Open Science Meeting. Um, and they have generously provided funds to, uh, to move this forward. How I can will moderate the agency panel. And again, broad overview of, of science achievements from the various agencies, what their perspective is on how well those achievements have fit their, their particular agency mission, and hopefully some thinking about the road ahead. Then the bulk of the media is given over to a, a number of parallel sessions around 11 themes. And you can see the themes listed over there on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, we'll go over the, the number of abstracts that have been submitted through this. One, one very novel part of this is that a, a lot of the time in each of these parallel sessions has been given over to discussion. So rather than just having a short period for question and answer after each talk, there's something on the order of an hour associated with each of the each of the individual sessions to uh, for discussion and, and hopefully collaboration building um, identification of new paths forward. Some of the, the, the sessions have, have multiple settings, terrestrial atmosphere in particular, were large enough to acquire a couple of different uh, different sessions. And if we go to the next slide please. So when we originally uh, laid this out we had a a larger number of, of themes. And you can see those listed here in the number of abstracts that were submitted in response to uh, those original themes. You can see that the, uh, you know, the response has been, been in general quite good on most of the themes. Um, and if we go to the next slide, please, which is the final one. And this is how the, uh, how the meeting has ended up being organized in terms of parallel sessions where the the two numbers on either side of the slash are the number of talks and the number of posters. Um, we had a number of early career scientists apply to attend the meeting, but they required travel support. Um, unfortunately, we were unable to, to generate enough sponsorship by travel support for all the early the career scientists who, who wished to attend. So we lost a number of abstracts um, that we were unable to support their attendance. So you can see the, the numbers there. The final numbers are 101 talks and 39 posters. There are a few trickling in, so those numbers will probably go up a little bit from here. But, uh, but that's where things stand right now. And then right, thanks for the update. Did, did any of the co-chairs have anything else to add? I, I just wanted to add one other thing and, and just highlight, although Craig, Craig made mention of it, that um, one of the things we're really looking for in the discussion periods is the development of collaboration among um, scientists who are funded by different agencies so that we can start to build um, kind of the, the grassroots side of the um, interagency observing network, uh, started by getting collaboration between investigators and um, work both grassroots up or bottoms up as well as top down through some of these uh, processes like IARPIC.
Bennett, do you have any uh, any thoughts? Uh, I think you did a great job of covering it, Craig. All right, well, thank you for that great overview, Craig. I'm sure uh, you would field emails or questions to anybody that uh, had something between now and the meeting. Certainly, yes. All right, our last agenda item is to uh, do some agency updates. So, uh, Martin Jeffries, would you like to kick us off with that? Yes, uh, thanks, Jeremy. Can you hear me? I think I'm unmuted. We can hear you. Thank you, good. A um, couple of things. The ONR C-State uh, field experiment is underway as, um, as we speak. Uh, they've been at sea actually since the 1st of October. Uh, they're in the Chukchi Sea, working in and around the ice edge and also penetrating into the pack ice aboard the Sikuliak, the research vessel Sikuliak. We're getting regular reports from the ship and uh, everything seems to be going very well. Um, they're probably a little over halfway through, but they're already talking about how everyone's getting the data that they, more, more than the data they wanted. It's just working out very well at the moment. Um, so uh, it seems to be going very successfully. Um, the other item is that the Arctic report card, which is an interagency and international uh, effort that's um, published online each year, um, subject to external review and revision and approval for release by NOAA. And of course, uh, there not being a government shutdown on the 11th of December, subject to all those caveats, the report card will be released at an AGU press conference on Tuesday the 15th of December. So um, watch out for that if you're available. Uh, you're welcome to attend the press conference and learn more about the report card, which just today went off to the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program for external review. And I I, I mentioned the report card in this context and observing team meeting because the report card is about observations of the state of the Arctic environment represented by different components that are reported on. We focus very much on the observations, the facts. It doesn't delve greatly into explanation and attribution and so on. It just states this is what happened in 2015. This is how it compared to last year. This is how it compares to recent decades, depending on the length of the record you're looking at. Okay, that's it from ONR. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Martin? All right. Thanks a lot, Martin. Uh, Will Ambrose, do you want to do uh, NSF? Are you on? Yeah, I'm on. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Um, yeah, I don't have too much to report. As many of you know, the, uh, the panel to deal with the proposals submitted to NSFA on uh, last year will be uh, November 2nd and 3rd. Um, and that's really about all I've got to report. All right. Thanks, Will. Any questions for Will? All right. I'll do the report out for NOAA. Uh, it's Many of you may have heard uh, the Resolka cruise that was supposed to happen uh, a few weeks ago was delayed uh, due to uh, weather and mechanical issues with the ship. And so we're not going to be able to do it in this calendar year, but we're looking for uh, an early summer uh, retry with what would be this, what should have been this year's Resolve Commission. Uh, and we're still planning out for what our 2016 result commission will be. Uh, the Arctic Research Program has also made its uh, sort of tentative funding decisions for FY16 based on the continuing resolution scenario. So we'll be reaching out uh, to PIs and, and letting everyone know uh, what the, the funding status of programs are going to be for this year. Uh, I'll be at the uh, Ocean Science uh, Open Sciences meeting in Seattle. And I think we'll, Will, uh, Will and Martin will be as well. So 
uh, I'm sure the three of us would be happy to talk um, more about anything that's going on at that time. So uh, are there any other program managers for agencies that are uh, able to do an update right now on the phone? Uh, Jeremy, this is Libby. Would it be okay? Oh, Libby. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, yep, I was going to point to you. Uh, Libby is the director of the Ocean Acidification Program, for those of you who don't know her. Uh, so go for it, Libby. Yeah, so, I, I, so I'm at NOAA, and I haven't participated in this group before, so I'm not sure if this is exactly the right forum, but I just wanted to throw out that um, my, myself, along with my collaborator from State Department, um, have put in a, a, a pro project um, into the Arctic Council initiative, and it's, I guess it's an initiative within the Arctic Council, what would you call it? Mm -hmm. Whatever, right. that. Uh, and it's focused on ocean acidification, sort of on expansion of the global ocean acidification observing network. Um, throughout the Arctic and bringing in uh, partners in other countries um, it might involve a potential workshop, uh, which would involve capacity building with um, with indigenous groups. And so we're we're a little, you know, we we're we're at the fairly early stages here, but I'm hoping that there might be a forum within this um, Arctic observing. Um, uh, I don't know, what, you, what do you call it? Arctic, uh, Arctic Observing System Collaboration Team um, to maybe find some partners to work with us. So that's, just wanted people to be know about this and it's gonna be sort of unfolding over the next year and a half or so. All right, thanks, any questions for Libby about that? Libby, this is Sarah. Um, I'm wondering, can you post something about the project on the IARPIC Collaborations website so people can get a few more details? Yeah, I think that would be a really good next step. <laughs> okay, and yeah, then we'll we'll send out an email um, with the meeting notes that uh, identifies the link and people can ask Libby questions directly through the website. Yeah. No. Um, so I think that, that would help. Thanks, Libby. So what I posted in the, I was just looking at the website, so in the document place or like updates, it looks like you have a couple different places where. Go ahead and post it as an update and you can attach a document to it. Great, perfect. Thanks. All right, any other? Discussion points or things we need to cover? Sandy, do you have anything else uh, on your list? Well, the the final agenda item, um, you mean from the agency updates or would you like to talk about the, uh, the possibility yeah. of a, a live um, collaboration team meeting in Seattle? Yeah, that's what I wanted to move into was the okay. uh, possible meeting in Seattle. Yep, no, no agency updates from my side. Jeremy, it's Martin. Okay, Could I so make a comment in now, please? Sure. Thanks. Um, I understand that um, Fran Ulmer, who is the chair of the Arctic Research Commission and also um, Secretary of State John Kerry's science advisor for the chairmanship of the US chairmanship of the Arctic Council. She was at the Arctic Circle uh, meeting in Iceland last week. And apparently there was a lot of talk there about the need for an Arctic observing system, Arctic observing network. We need more observations, et cetera, et cetera. She heard a lot of Europeans uh, going on about this. And so Fran has returned and uh, she's sort of on the war path uh, wanting to know why don't we have an Arctic observing network? What's going on? Who's going to do something about it, et cetera? Um, I think part of the problem here is that there's a lack of awareness among many who are not vested in what's already going in, on in terms of Arctic observing, there's a lack of awareness of, of just how much is actually going on in the Arctic in terms of, of scientific and research driven and other kinds of observations. Um, it's not perfect. 
there are gaps, there is more that could be done, but we're in a better situation than we were, say, 10 or a dozen years ago. But I don't think this message gets out. As I say, there's a lack of awareness of this. And so I think the open science meeting next month is a very important venue from that perspective. And I think there needs to be a continuing discussion and some action on what can we do to raise the awareness of the good work that is being done in Arctic observing in the Arctic so that there are fewer people on the warpath um, demanding to know what's, why isn't there an Arctic observing network? What, what are you going to do about it? Who's going to take it on and so on? Okay, I'm off my high horse and my rant is over. Uh, this is Matt Sheep, if I could add something to that. I, Martin, you, you brought up the Arctic Observing Open Science meeting, and I, I think that this has really um, been a lot of the discussion we've had, exactly what you're saying there, that, that at many levels we need to raise the awareness, and some of that is really within the scientific community as well, so that we can, at, at kind of the grassroots level, level um, build those connections and build that identity so that we ourselves understand that, and then um, that kind of floats up to, to higher levels, you know, Fran's level and, and beyond, and then also to, to the international level. So I think it's, um, I, I totally agree that it's, this is an important meeting and that perhaps we should consider, um, you know, the frequency with which we have these meetings so that we can really carve out for ourselves what this identity is, what this uh, interagency Arctic Observing Network is. Uh, and then hopefully from that, you know, better understanding, uh, we can move in a more intentional way towards developing that in ways that are strategically important for different agencies and, and for the nation. Yeah, this is Craig, and you know that's exactly right. When we, we started the discussion about this open science meeting, what became clear very quickly is that the, the, there's there's some sense of identity within the NSF AON program because it's a program, but we're really talking about a, a much larger Arctic Observing Network with a a larger number of, of components, and then at that point, the the branding, if you will, the identity becomes up, becomes more confused, and then there was a clear need to start to, to sharpen that up and, and develop an identity and, and establish a true network, build a true network. So this and we were hoping this, this would not be a one-time activity. That you was have on kind of a two-year time scale. Uh, so one of the things that we might consider then is perhaps doing some sort of a outbrief at the um, March um, Arctic Observing Summit that's part of the AASS, uh, what is it, Ar Arctic Science Summit Week um, in Fairbanks where um, we have a side meeting uh, or a slot in which we can it, perhaps engage more fully with IARPIC and uh, some of the other agency leaders about uh, how do we, you know, what is a way to publicize um, the, all the assets and, and all the activities that constitute the U.S. Arctic Observing Network. So it might be something we would want to think about. Um, this is Chris Campbell, and um, I believe that the topic right now is supposed to be um, updates on what agencies are doing, correct? It, it is. I think uh, Martin's comment um, maybe steered us back to the, the open science meeting, but Chris, if you have right. a, an agency update, by all means, mm -hmm. please. Sure, I'd be happy to share with you. Um, as you know, uh, Shell has pulled out of the Chukchi Sea, and that has created a certain amount of uncertainty um, regarding applied science in the Arctic, especially the Western Arctic, um, with regard to our agency. And uh, but that said, um, I wanted to just let you know that our social indicators study is underway and I believe that there will be um, work being done in Kekpovic very shortly uh, as the first community that will be surveyed um, for that survey, which is by Steve Brond and Jack Cruz with um, assistance from uh, 
Joan Nyman Larson in Iceland. Um, so that ties back to the um, Arctic Social Indicators um, work that was undertaken by the Sustainable Development Working Group, um, you know, a couple of years ago. So that's one thing. And the second thing is um, I've been working with uh, Mike Brubaker and um, we've received authority to uh, work with, to engage in cooperative agreements with with uh, ANTHC, which is a departure from um, the past where it's been very rigid that we only deal with state agencies. And this is to help enhance the scientific rigor and help um, provide support for the LEO program so that it can continue to be, so it can become sustainable over um, a, a longer period. Um, so this is a multi-year effort and will be um, funded, well, this, this should be finalized in the next couple of months. Um, and uh, those are just a couple of updates of the kinds of science that we're doing in social research with BOEM up here in Alaska. Thank you. Chris, this is Sarah. Um, thanks for those updates. That is very useful. The um, update on the um, social indicator study, could you provide an, an update on that on, on the website? Um, because I think there will be a lot of people in the communities team that will also be interested in that. I'd be happy to. Um, maybe you could just shoot me an email about um, the level of detail that you'd want in an update, and I'll go ahead and provide that. Great, thanks, Chris. Okay, thank you. Um, it's taken a long time to actually be able to implement because we had to go through the OMB process in order to get approval for this survey. You know, we want to be able to quantify the data. So um, we did need to get OMB approval. And so we're through that, thankfully, and we're at the implementation stage. Yeah, Sarah and Jeremy, this is Molly McCammon. Hey, Molly. Hi. Go ahead. I, 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 on the phone, I wasn't able to get on the WebEx, but um, I just wanted to respond to two things. Um, one, to the, the topic that Martin brought up about um, Fran's concern that there not be, that there isn't a, why aren't we uh, implementing an Arctic observing network? And I think the challenge is that whenever um, the all of the, the federal agencies want credit for the work that they're doing, and whenever you start putting together all of those pieces that they do as part of either their mission responsibilities that aren't necessarily uh, research specific, then you end up with this overwhelming load of, of uh, activities that everyone gets bogged down in that. And somehow I think we have to, to keep it at a higher level um, uh, of just major programs or major activities um, and have some kind of a, a, um, a, a network agreement that you are part of this network and as part of this network, your program agrees to do these things, whether it's uh, share data or participate in, in um, networking type activities or something. But I do think that there, there are some fairly uh, simple things that could be done to move that further along. Um, and then the second thing I wanted to bring up is that uh, the Alaska Ocean Observing System Board is meeting on November 3rd, and one of our items that we're going to be discussing there, we're going to have a session on the implications of kind of shell um, pullout from the Chukchi um, in terms of their logistical support for uh, equipment deployment and retrievals. Um, there's uh, support for certain um, research and monitoring activities and what that holds for the future, um, what it means for things like the, the Shell Baseline Studies Program with the North Slope Borough and the Northwest Arctic Boroughs, and also um, what it means for the data that they've already collected and making sure that that data is um, curated, archived, and made publicly accessible. So just wanted to let you know that that is going to be on our agenda. All right, thanks, Molly. 
So, Sandy, in our last couple of minutes, do you want to uh, say something about the meeting we're going to try to pull together in Seattle next month? Sure. Um, so the the opportunity we had started to discuss with the chairs for the open science observing meeting, uh, open the observing open science meeting, uh, was that both Jeremy and myself are going to be there as well as many of the people who regularly participate in the call, and so we wanted to gauge interest in having an in person meeting with uh, you know some kind of teleconnectivity for those who aren't there, um, something that can maybe be more dialogue driven. Uh, and take advantage of the FaceTime. Um, so, you know, we don't have a, a we're, we're already over our, our time allotment here. Um, if anybody f feels strongly uh, supportive of this idea, or if more than one of you feel strongly supportive of this idea, or have some thoughts on how we could use that forum, um, please let us know. Uh, people are going to be pretty busy overall at the meeting, and so uh, we would do it if, if it was something that would add a lot of value. Sandy, this is uh, Lil and Joe. We're, we're sort of crossing time zones. We got our time zones wrong, but we are on now. Hi, Lil, welcome. We, we got a, 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 some surrogates to provide us an update on your workshop um, earlier. Okay. Well, um, did they cover the U.S. Geo, the IRMA, um, and the uh, amendment to the uh, typology for C bonds that will come out as a formal statement? And so several white papers have been submitted to, or either have been submitted or in the process of being submitted for a total of five. Oh, great. No, we didn't, we didn't hear um, as much detail as that. Uh, if would it be possible to post an update to the website and, and summarize some things for people? Absolutely, I will post that uh, with my profound apologies for uh, getting the time zone wrong. Oh, not to worry. I know you've been traveling, uh, but yeah, we we would value an update like that. Uh, other thoughts on a, a in-person meeting in Seattle? I would support that strongly. This is Lil. Was that for me? <laughs> uh, no, we were ju we were just uh, uh, looking for a bit of a straw poll on an in-person meeting. But since we are since we are uh, quite a bit over the hour at this point, um, perhaps. Uh, if you have ideas of how we could use the time, I think that would be really valuable to hear. Maybe you could um, send an email or, or make a posting in the comment field following um, this event so we could get some feedback on, on how to use that time. That sounds like a good idea, Molly. <laughs> All right, so um, Jeremy, uh, anything else before we close? I think, I think that's it. Thank you all very much for uh, for calling in today and staying uh, six minutes late. Man, Thank you, everybody. Coming on late. Yeah, Jeremy. we we really apologize. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks for the talk with all. Bye, everybody. Thanks again. Thanks. Bye. Bye.